Dukes has twang. Does your mayo have it? Do you ask for it by name when you go out to eat? Do you display your devotion to it for all the world to see? Can it elevate your lime cilantro aioli to a level that's borderline holy? If not, you're probably using the wrong mayo. That's because only Duke's mayo has twang. It's that little southern something that elevates food from good to downright ridiculous. Get Duke's. It's got twang. Happy Tuesday, everybody, and welcome in to the Graham Lincoln McLean podcast presented by Duke's Mayo. This is the Duke's Mayo Bowl preview episode, the episode that you wait for all year. And of course, <laughs> it's brought to you by Duke's Mayo. We hope that everybody had a wonderful Christmas and we have so many amazing guests today. I'm just going to run through them real fast. Okay. Just so you know, just so you know what to, pre to prepare for here. We have the executive director of the Charlotte Sports Foundation, Danny Morrison. We have head coach Dave Doran of the NC State Wolfpack, and we have wide receiver Thayer Thomas of the NC State Wolfpack, and then we have Eric McLean and me <laughs> giving our picks on this game. So it really can't get much better. I don't know how it could, KG. I mean, th this is literally, you talk about all year. I mean, at least the bowl season, everyone has been waiting on this episode. And it's finally yes. here, and it's out, and it's all about mayo. Uh, you, you will find that some people like it a little more than others, but hey, it, destiny arrives all the same. Someone said something mayo that we coming. we probably should have cut out. We might blur it out. We might blur it out. You'll see. You'll see. We might like superimpose my mouth on theirs and yeah. change it to where they say, "I love mayo." It's my. It favorite. was. It's a perfectly reasonable take, <laughs> but it offended me. So it we'll did offend me. It also offended me. We'll so see. anyway, uh, my favorite time of year. I hope you had a great Christmas, everybody. It was so much fun. Very cold. This was a very cold <gasps> Christmas. Some people are in Texas uh, for the holidays, and it's uh, there, there's Freezing. ice storms, blizzards. It's a million degrees below zero, if you will. Uh, that doesn't happen much over there. Yeah. But excited to jump into this episode, KG. Let's set the stage first. We want you guys to understand the bowl game here with the Mayo Bowl. It's history. It's important. Uh, so without any further ado, let's get to the executive director of the bowl itself, Danny Morrison. Danny Morrison, welcome back to the podcast. My brother, super excited to talk to you today. We've got the Duke's Mayo Bowl coming up. I know you're super excited about that. Well, we're really excited about it. We couldn't have a, a better matchup. We love... Uh, what NC State and Maryland have done throughout the year. If you look at uh, uh, a lot of great wins, but even their losses were to um, outstanding teams. You look at Maryland, lost uh, close games to Michigan and to Ohio State, and, of course, uh, NC State finished the year with a, with a great win over their rival. And uh, two, two excellent coaches, two great programs, and an old ACC matchup That's right. where <laughs> if you look at their overall record – 33, 33, and 4. So it's awesome. uh, should be fun, and we couldn't be more excited. I, I love that. So this is y'all's 21st year of the bowl game in Charlotte. You're going to have your 1 millionth fan in attendance of the game, which is just so incredible. What does this game and, and the impact you know mean for the Charlotte area? Well, our mission as the Charlotte Sports Foundation is to – Bring economic have an economic impact uh, to the Charlotte community, especially to the hospitality area. And uh, we all know they were crushed during COVID. Mm. So to be able to do, make an e e economic impact for the hotels, the restaurants, and just the whole uptown of Charlotte is important. And we also uh, have the mission of adding to the quality of life. And so when you bring two stored programs in like Maryland and NC State, uh, that has a positive impact. And then you look at some 21 years, and uh, Will Webb, who did an amazing job as executive director and all of his work with uh, it was called the Belt Bowl then and uh, now with a great uh, partner in Duke's Mayo, uh, it's just it's just had a huge impact, and uh, uh, one million fans. That's going to be uh, a lot of fun to celebrate. 
Yeah, that is a big deal. And look, it's been a, a big month for you guys with the ACC football championship. We know the Duke's Mayo Classic and the Jumpman Invitational, which I love because you guys are having uh, North Carolina and Michigan play on the women's side as well, which I think is going to be a really big game. So can you share a little more about the Charlotte Sports Foundation and just their role in bringing all these amazing events to Charlotte? Well, we uh, again, our mission is to bring high-profile events that have economic impact and so generally, we've had uh, football games. We've had the ACC um, baseball championship mm-hmm. when the ACC basketball championship's been here. We've been involved in that as well. And we work so well together in, in Charlotte. We're so fortunate. Uh, we have great venues with the Spectrum Center and Bank of America Stadium and Truist Field and the city, county, CRVA, and all the venues. We really work so well together. I think the secret sauce here is that we all get along well, nobody cares who gets the credit, and we just really work on bringing these very special events to Charlotte. So the Jumpman, we've been working on that since 2019. It really mm-hmm. uh, came from uh, Joe Castiglione's idea, who was the uh, who is the AD at uh, Oklahoma. We've been friends for a long time. And his question was, wouldn't it be terrific to bring the four original Jordan brand schools for both football and basketball together Mm. for this doubleheader. And so to have North Carolina and Michigan and Florida and Oklahoma, and we decided early on we wanted it to be men and women. And we think that's unique. Uh, We think uh, they're all uh, high quality teams. And we believe it'll be a special uh, two days here in Charlotte. Uh, that's awesome, Danny. Can't wait to see it. You talk about that impact. I mean, to have those four schools, uh, eight teams walking around, that, that's a big deal. That's a pretty big deal and going to be really cool. Let's jump back into this bowl game. And you mentioned that matchup, number 23, NC State, Maryland, an old, old ACC foe. How excited were you when you found out this was the matchup? Well, we were thrilled. We, we really targeted um, both NC State and Maryland as we were looking through uh, the whole bowl landscape. And it never fails to generally play whack-a-mole uh, sometime on, uh, during the process. And uh, thankfully, it all fell in the right way, and we were able to get uh, the matchup that we, we really aspired to have. Danny, what makes the Dukes Mayo Bowl so special for fans? I mean, one of the things I love and I love about Dukes and you guys in this bowl is you don't take yourselves too seriously, which is one of my favorite qualities in anything, in any (laughs) human, uh, but especially in my bowl game. So what makes uh, this bowl game so unique and fun for fans? Well, first of all, the title partner, we couldn't have a better one in Dukes Mayo. They understand that we, we need to make it fun. We need to have a special experience for the players, which we do. Um, they have a driving experience at Charlotte Motor Speedway. That's mm. unique. They have a shopping spree at Belk. We have the community service with Second Harvest Food Bank. So uh, they really ha- the feedback we get from the players every year is they, they really have a, a nice experience. And we have had fun with it. We got a really talented staff. We got a young staff. Uh, of course, you all know the fun that Miller has with things <laughs> on social media. <laughs> Miller Yoho, who does our marketing and social media. We just have fun with the game, and it should be fun. We know the importance of the game. If you look back on last year's game, I think it would be fair to say it was quite a springboard for the kind of season that University of South Carolina had this year. And we we had uh, two coaches that embraced the Dukes-Mayo bath last year. Uh, Mike Brown, if he would have won, was uh, all ready to go. And, of course, Shane Beamer, after the win, made it a lot of fun and uh, a lot of play on social media. And it really uh, – it, it's just been a great bowl uh, and for a long, long time. And we're blessed to have a, a terrific title partner in Duke's Mayo. Danny, last one for you. We'll get you out of here. What is your favorite condiment at the tailgate, and why is it mayo? <laughs> well, that's, yeah, that's pretty obvious on the Duke's Mayo side. But I will say this. Uh, we lived in Greenville, South Carolina when I was growing up, first through fifth grades. And, uh, you know, that's the home of uh, Duke's Mayo. That's right. And my mother was uh, 
uh, so I grew up on 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 Duke's Mayo. My mother was a, a, a an advocate for it. Easy enough. We love there that. You go. Danny, appreciate your time, brother. Thank you for joining us. Danny Morrison, always a pleasure to hear from him, and, and just the history and the impact, all the great things that the Duke's Mayo Bowl has accomplished in the city of Charlotte, and of course the Charlotte Sports Foundation and what that means to the city. A lot of great stuff there, and, and great to have him as a friend to talk about this bowl game. KG, I, I want to, as our Duke's Mayo guest, and we have two others throughout this entire episode, I just thought this would be a good time to remind people of the beef tenderloin that I did <laughs> over the Christmas holiday. And oh. let me just tell you guys, if, if you have a holiday meat, if you have a holiday entree, I know there's sides and everything, yeah. but hit me up because I want to know. I want to see what everyone did, what, what you do uh, for fun. A lot of people do ribeyes, I've learned, because uh, it was kind of really? traditional, right? Everyone does ham or turkey, but now we're branching out. We're, we're going to the red meat, and that's what I love to see. And here's the deal. I was going to find mustard, right? I was watching all these recipes, and everybody, again, was super discreet about, like, what mustard they use. And so Ooh. me, a proud Duke's mayo person, a Duke's person, I'm like, you got to scream this from the mountaintops. What yeah. are you putting on there? And so, KG, I finally did it. I was able to use the brown sugar bourbon, and I've been Favorite. saving it. I've been saving this for quite some time because I knew this was coming down the pipeline of things that I would be preparing for the family let me just tell y'all, one of my favorite things I've ever cooked. I've never done a beef tenderloin before. I lathered that thing up with all the Duke's mustard you could ever imagine. Sprinkled some awesome Texas, by the way, meat church. Let's seasoning go. on there, a nice rub. And then cooked that thing at 300 degrees, 275 for about an hour and a half. And KG, I could take it off and use a spoon to cut it. And it was just unbelievable. If you haven't tried it out, you definitely need to. Great thing, beef tenderloin. But then... That twang, it's just in there. Mm -hmm. And a big reason is that my friends over at Duke's, they made it better. Go check it out. Recipes posted on social media. You got to check this out. You got to make this recipe. You have to. Find it on Mac's Instagram, on our YouTube channel as well, on the shorts um, part there. And the brown sugar bourbon, I mean, I've been adamant. But that is, <laughs> I think that's my favorite thing that Duke's made. It was I mean, good. It was really stuff. good. It was solid. Brown I was sugar like, bourbon mustard. Listen, mm. I always believe you. Like, I don't ever, I was this much skeptical. You see that? Skeptical. You skeptical. skeptical. I was so skeptical, <laughs> I can't even say the right word. Um, but it blew away all expectations. Yeah, it's so, so you didn't hype it up enough. Yeah, that brown sugar bourbon mustard. <laughs> I, I, I've said it before, it'll change your life. You can put it on anything. I have, this is so what gross because I love tomatoes. I have just put it on a, on tomato slices and, and I ate it. Bids or it didn't happen, KG. That's all I'm going to say. Let's move on from that. I think I've said too much. <laughs> the next person that we are talking to here on our Duke's Mayo Bowl preview episode is the head man himself, Eric McLean. We are talking with Dave Doran, who has been on with us a few times. We always appreciate his time. We know he's very busy. It's time of year preparing for a bowl game. Oh, and hiring some new coaches. We talked to him about that. So let's oh, get into- Oh, and signing day, by the way. Oh, signing day, yes. And then I'm sure he's finding some time to fish, as we know, Dave. That's right. So our next Duke's Mayo guest on this episode is NC State head coach, Dave Doran. <clears throat> All right, Coach Dave Doran, welcome back. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, listen, when, when I look at this season and the opportunity for nine wins, I mean, massive deal here in the bowl game. I know that means a lot to you and this team. Yeah, shoot, I'd love to end on another positive. You know, we did that with our, our finale at uh, UNC. So anytime you can beat your rival and then win your bowl game, particularly for us with what happened in our bowl last year, not getting to play it, you know, we'd love to have that opportunity to get out there and finish on a positive. No doubt, Coach. And, you know, what's crazy about this game, and I'm not asking you to confirm or deny anything here, but you look at all these defensive guys for you that – may possibly be playing their last game in an NC State uniform. When you look at Isaiah Moore and Drake Thomas, Peyton Wilson, Tanner Engel, I mean, the list goes on and on. What have these guys meant to your program? Yeah, they're awesome, man. They're, they're such good dudes to be around. They play hard. They're physical. They're fun. You know, um, they're more than just players. You know what I mean? These are guys that uh, have left a mark on this university and, in my heart, you know, I'll definitely be more than a coach to them, and they'll be more than a player to me as this thing continues. So I'm just excited to go down one more time with them and compete and watch them run around and hit people. 
<laughs> we're we're excited for that too, Coach. And when you look at this defense, I mean, yeah. the, the I mean the best defense in the ACC. You look statistically and the things that you guys were able to do. Um, how much does it just speak about that unit? Because you know this team in general, uh, specifically the defense, came in with a lot of expectation. And for you guys to meet that, I mean, that had to be pretty cool for you to see that unfold. Yeah, well, I'm really proud of Tony Gibson and the defensive staff. First of all, they deserve a lot of credit, along with the players. Because um, they designed the scheme and called the, the plays and set up the practice plans for these guys to be ready to perform. And the players executed and, and uh, got better and better throughout and, and rose to the challenge in certain games and uh, led the conference in interceptions as well. You know, uh, did a bunch of good things for us and they carried the water. You know, I mean, I, there was a lot with the offense having four quarterbacks having to, to be involved. Special teams and defense were going to have to be the strength for us to have a chance to win the games we won, and they did. They, they performed at a high level. And, Coach, so you mentioned that quarterback room. I mean, my goodness, I, I don't think I've quite seen anything like that where the injury bug hits you so hard and you have to have four different guys go in there, four different guys get wins. I don't think I've ever seen that anywhere. I mean, it's pretty cool when – it's great to say next man up and, and to live by that, but I mean, for your your program to actually go and do it, you, it's a cool thing to see. Every guy that got their shot, I mean, they they just stepped up, did their job, and you know, got some victories. Well, nobody's seen it, Eric, because it's never happened. <laughs> yeah, there you that's go. What I was going to say, I'm go. pretty sure it's never happened. Yeah, it's never happened in college football, and I hope for wow. everybody's sake they don't have to go through what we did. <laughs> uh, no one's won eight games with four different quarterbacks. So that's wow unique in its own right for everybody in college football. I think it's just a testament to the grit of our program. You know, I think that's living proof that our guys step up and compete. And, yeah. you know, uh, the guys around them competed to, to elevate their level of play to make up for what we we're missing. And guys stepped up and took advantage of opportunities, you know, whether it was MJ or Ben Fenley mm -hmm. or Jack Chambers in the Florida State game, each of them had their moment to shine and the players around them helped them. So it says a lot about, you know, this program and the culture of this program, I think, that we can overcome that kind of adversity. Yeah. Is Finley going to be the guy coach? Is I didn't know if MJ was season ending. Is there a no, chance for yeah. both of them to play? Yeah, right now they're both practicing. Um, oh, great. We haven't made decisions on kind of what we're doing yet in the bowl, but they they both have taken all the reps this week. And awesome. Yeah, MJ's totally healthy now, so we're excited that he's back and him and Ben are, are out there competing right now, getting better. That's really good to hear because, I mean, MJ Morris and just what we saw from him in those in those little moments was excellent. Um, Coach, speaking of kind of some changes, you've made some changes with some new hires on the offensive side of the ball with Coach and I and Coach 2J, I believe we're saying that right. Let me know if we're not. Um, oh, there's Max Dog. So, Sam, Sam says that's <laughs> yeah, correct. She, she's a, a little wolf pack there. But nice. what can NC State fans look forward to with these two new hires? Why are you excited about them? Yeah, well, first of all, you know, super excited for Tim Beck, you know, to be the head coach yeah. of Coastal Carolina. And it's now the fourth guy that is under me that's gotten a head coaching opportunity. So it's kind of cool, you know, when that happens. And appreciate everything he's done for our program. And gave us a chance to go out and, and kind of evolve again. And, uh, you know, uh, Coach and I, I've been on the other sideline going against the guy and, and uh, done it four different times. You know, at Kansas, I had to play him at Texas Tech when he was running Mike Leach's offense, you know, and then watched the BYU thing where he was just running people over in that offense with Bronco. And then we played him twice at UVA uh, with two different quarterbacks, you know, um, and the offense evolved the entire time. They went from – almost like a wing tee with the first quarterback, you know, with all the orbit motions and insert motions and crack block schemes. And then Brennan Armstrong comes in and just starts chucking it all over the yard. And then he goes to Syracuse and completely turns around Schrader's career up there. And the creativity and, and the ability he has in his mind to evolve his scheme around the talent that he gets is unique. It's really unique, and, and I think for us, when you play NC State, we're a unique defense, and this gave me an opportunity to be a unique offense too. And so I'm really excited about that. I think we're now a tough prep on both sides of the ball for our opponents, and sometimes maybe you don't have as many five-star or four-star guys. That helps us, you know, as a football program to have coaches that know how to make it hard 
on the other sidelines. And Robert uh, has a 14-year career with Garrett 2J, our offensive line coach. They were together for seven at BYU and seven um, at, at uh, UVA. And, and so, you know, when the, when the OC and the O-line coach are like that, it helps. Um, helps a lot because, you know, they're finishing each other's sentences. They know how to teach it, and it helps a lot. I love that, Coach. And, and just when I think of his offenses, man, exactly what you just said. I mean, the preparation has to just be mind-numbing for the other team because, you know, there's so much that he can pull from and just such a smart coach. Just kind of your process, I guess, with that and, and, you know, all these head coaches that you have, you know, helped create and mold and, you know, do you have like a list of guys to get in your process? Or I've heard other guys where when it happens, they go and they go and find people. What is your, I guess, you know, kind of awareness level with that, with going to get the next guy if someone does leave? You know, I keep a constant list uh, of every position in my phone, um, in my notes. So I have a list of every coach, recruiting, you know, strength, whatever, because you never know. We lose people here. It seems like every year somebody, you know, gets poached and, or gets an opportunity to be a head coach or go to the NFL. And, and so, you know, I, I try to keep an ongoing list so I'm prepared in, in that situation. I don't like having to start from scratch with no ideas, you know. Sure, sure. Sometimes you get lucky and, you know, and timing frees up a guy that you really wanted to work with. Sometimes mm-hmm. it's not that easy. Mm-hmm. Uh, in this case, you know, it's just Ruff and McNeil and Robert and I are very close friends and uh, they've, they've worked together multiple times in their careers. And so when the opening happened, Ruff, you know, said, hey, Dave, you know, I don't know if you'd be interested, but wouldn't be doing my job if I didn't tell you about Robert. I know you've coached against him. Wow. Um, so then I talked to Bronco, who, you know, obviously has worked with him a lot uh, about a bunch of different things. And Bronco also talked to me about Robert. And I was like, I got to try to make this happen. You know, <laughs> and so called Coach Babers and asked permission. And, and then, you know, went wow, out. that's awesome. Yeah, I, I didn't. I would not. Well, I, I guess I should have expected that second part, but call, the calling Coach Babers part and just kind of giving him the heads up. That's that's really cool, Coach. Let's talk about the Duke's Mayo Bowl. I mean, this is why we're all here. This big bowl game <laughs> in Charlotte, playing Maryland, a former ACC rival, and you look at the series here and everything. It feels weird that it's an ACC Big Ten game. But what stands out to you about Maryland and the challenge they're going to present? Well, you know, Michael Oxley is a really good offensive coach. Uh, so is Dan Enos, his offensive coordinator. I've got a lot of respect for both of them. I've coached against them both when they were play callers uh, in the Big Ten, uh, Michigan State and Illinois, and have, have followed Locks. Um, you know, I, I think he's a great recruiter. He's got good talent on his roster. You know, his quarterback is a, a proven guy that's put up a bunch of points. They can run. So it's going to be a challenge. You know, I, I think uh, our defense matches up well with anybody. So, you know, feel good about that, but they're going to have a great challenge in front of them. You know, defensively, they've got some good players in the secondary, and they've got an NFL secondary. There's three guys that could be drafted. And so, you know, we've got to be able to get open and do some some things to, to help our receivers there. But I look forward to it. We're 33-33-4 and four head-to-head yeah. over the <laughs> ACC records, I guess. And not that this is an ACC game, but it does add a little bit to the mix for our fan bases. That's right. A, a little familiarity there with, yeah. with each other that I know everyone's excited about and, and really looking forward to. Coach, you mentioned that secondary from Maryland and the things that they do well and you know the potential for the next step for them. When, when you have two younger quarterbacks, you know, is it mixing up with the run? Is it quick passes out front? How would you like best to, I guess, get them comfortable in the game plan and then really just open it up? Yeah, you know, I think you respect – everyone you play, but you don't fear anybody, you know, and we're going to be aggressive. I mean, we're going to do what we can do to, to get our guys open and run and get running the football will help our quarterbacks. It always does. Uh, they're going to play a lot of man, you know, that's what they do. And, and so we got to be able to beat man coverage in this game. And you know, I think our receivers are excited about the challenge. So it'll be fun to go down there and see what we can do against them. No doubt. We, we spoke to uh, Thayer Thomas earlier uh, in, in the week and, and just his excitement about this game. Say, I, I haven't played a Big Ten team yet. Uh, yeah. So it's kind of get that final notch in his belt uh, for his career would be really cool. He also pointed out this was the first stadium uh, that he ever played in, in a Wolfpack jersey. So cool kind of capital yeah. moment here. Last question for you, Coach. We'll get you out. Uh, a scale of 1 to 10, how excited <laughs> are you to get this mayo right here dumped on your head after uh-huh. the victory that you guys get in Charlotte? <laughs> yeah. 
Well, it's for the kids, right? That's right. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> $10,000 to a charity. So I'm excited for that. You know, I mean, it is my least favorite condiment, I will say. I oh, put, no. <laughs> I don't put it on anything I eat. So I, I will be taking one for the team. Absolutely. And I'll do it with a smile when we win. I promise there you, you that. But, Coach, so, I had you know, a theory. It's part where... of the festivities, man. You know, I'm a good sport. <laughs> You are, you are. And here's my theory, because you, you have a good head of hair, okay? This is what you do. Thank you. Go Thank bald. You. Go bald for the game. Then you just grow back. I mean, that way you have nothing in the hair. Shave the face. And that it also shows how confident you are in your team. All right, I'm showing up bald. I know I'm taking mayo to the head. I got just a different idea. plan. I, I think I'm going to bring a sombrero and a poncho, you know. There you go. There you go. <laughs> okay, yeah. How about the uh, how about the charity, Coach? Is that your decision? Is that Duke's mayo? <laughs> what, what, you mentioned the charity there. Do you get to pick that? Yeah, I think that's a charity of choice for us. So we haven't oh, cool. figured that out yet, but we'll have some okay. good options when we get there and look forward to that. Hopefully I'm sitting there trying to make that decision at the that's end. That's right. That's for right. Well, kids. we appreciate for that for the kids, Coach. Well, we appreciate <laughs> you very much. Good luck. And uh, we're excited to see kind of this final hurrah from this 2022 team. Yeah. Man, Coach Doran, taking one for the team. There was a lot of suspense. You know, we, we were asking some people around the program. I was asking the Dukes Mayo folks, the Bowl folks. And for a while, everybody's like, man, we don't know. He hasn't made a decision. We don't know if it's going to happen. I we heard it from the to, man. No, you would do it. Come on, don't lie. We heard it from the man himself. We heard it from the man himself. He is all in for the Mayo, taking it for the team. He's a big Mayo fan, um, and it, he's going to love it. He's going to love it. Hadn't decided on the charity yet. I, I think he needs to get that going. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and then, you know, he, he's going to make it happen. The other interesting news of that is that MJ Morris is practicing and completely yes. healthy. I, I didn't know that. I thought that it was a knee, and he might be down for a little bit of time. But that's great news to hear that that young man is going to be back. Will he play in this game? Coach was a little vague about that. So, you know, both guys practicing, both guys competing uh, and, and I think, honestly, either option, the way that we saw them both when they had their time, when they had their mm -hmm. moments, you, you're super excited about it if you're an NC State fan. So I know one guy that's very excited to have either one of those guys healthy and slinging the ball all around, Thayer Thomas. He's next. Duke's Mayo guest. Let's ride. Thayer Thomas, my brother, welcome into the podcast. Thank you for joining us today. Listen, your final year at NC State, a lot of highs. A couple of lows, but really fun things and, and great accomplishments. What will you remember most about this season? Yeah, I would say just the adversity that this uh, team went through um, and sort of got over it a little bit, you know, having some, some success with four different quarterbacks. Um, <laughs> obviously, we had high hopes in the beginning of the season with uh, Devin at the helm of the quarterback. And then uh, we had to make some adjustments. And I think just – you know, capping it off in Chapel Hill um, with our, you know, fourth string guy um, getting the win um, just sort of shows what this team was made of. And, uh, you know, a, a, not a great season, but like a, a successful season just with sure. the adversity that we faced. So you you had the most receptions, you know, you've ever had in a season and you have another game to add to that. You're close to having the most yards you've ever had in a season. You've got to be proud of yourself to be in that go-to guy, be in that target, and just a reliable guy each and every week. Yeah, I just try to do whatever it takes for us to win. Um, I knew this this year, um, just also leading, like, with fall camp, I knew that if we wanted to have a successful year that I had to make the plays that came my way. Um, and just but going off of stats and stuff, like, I think my stats would be a lot different, you know, if we had, like, the one consistent quarterback situation. But at the end of the day, I think I really just made the most of any of the opportunities. Like, whoever was in there, I was just, you know, trying to make plays. And you sort of saw that with MJ. He sort of – with the three-game stretch that he really uh, started, mm -hmm. he, it seemed like he was coming my way a lot. Um, and we're just, I'm just looking forward to playing one more game and whoever's playing a quarterback at a bowl game, just, you know, being that guy for them. I like that you are keeping that open-ended, uh, not only for <laughs> us, but for anyone else who may be listening. I like that. Well, you mentioned the UNC win, and I mean, that was an epic win for you guys, for your fan base, for just NC State as a whole. We heard some of the talk before that game, some of the talk throughout the season. I, I love how much UNC and NC State don't like each other. So how much did that win mean for you, Thayer? Yeah, I mean, just going back to last year, the last two games that we played those guys, like it's been some monumental type wins, um, top 10 probably in school history of type of wins against those guys. You know, I look back at my freshman year when I was a freshman 
and I was playing a lot. And I, I, we beat UNC at Chapel Hill with Ryan Finley at quarterback. And then sort of fast forwarded to this year, you know, I'm playing with his little, little brother and we beat him in overtime again. And it's just, you know, crazy to think about, like, that's, that's pretty crazy. Um, but it, was, it meant a lot just to walk off the field uh, with the, with the women for sure. The one last time, especially with my brother, like that meant a lot. I know that. I know that's cool, especially that game, that rival at their place. Uh, and, and a lot of aspirations that they had to kind of crush those. I know that's fun uh, to do anytime you can for your for your rival. There, you, you mentioned that you're the favorite part of this season is just the adversity you guys face and, and how you were able to overcome that. You, you mentioned the four QBs started, four QBs got a win when their name was called there. How do you explain that grit, that, that next man up mentality where a lot of people talk about it, but you guys, I mean, exemplified it all season long? that's just who uh nc state is in general like we sort of i feel i feel like are looked down upon just compared to like the dukes the carolinas like in this area like um you know and just the guys that sort of nc state recruit like for me like i was a no star walk-on guy like we have a bunch of three star two star guys well maybe carolina has the four star five star guys that they get um and so that always puts a chip on our shoulder just to sort of show that that stuff doesn't matter at the end of the day when the, when the ball snap, you know, you know, everything's on the line. It doesn't really matter what kind of high school recruit you were versus us. Um, you know, it's, it all matters what you bring to the table that game and that day. So. I like it. I really do feel like that exemplifies NC state and your head coach and, and Dave Doran. Um, I, I want to ask about Ben Finley because I know you said you played with his older brother and his older brother was one of the greats at NC state. And this guy was four string. He was scout team. I mean, you're you're never going to think that all these injuries are going to happen. But can you tell me more about what you saw from him throughout fall camp, throughout the year? And did it surprise you at all how he played against North Carolina? I think Ben was the perfect type of guy for that situation to happen to. He's, he's very carefree. He really like, um, you know, sometimes too nonchalant, but there's, you need that sometimes as a yeah. as a quarterback and just in a as a competitor. You want to you don't want to be too uptight, which he's not. Um, and so there was times like you know he, he definitely didn't probably think he was never going to get in the game this year. I mean, the last time he got really in the game was two years ago when we went to Carolina. And so um, you know I, everybody knows how talented he is and um, what he's made of. And I mean it's in his blood. You saw his brother what he was able to do. And uh, I just think the team sort of just saw him at practice on a daily basis. And actually I felt like wanted to give him a chance to play at some point, just because um, we knew how talented he was. And especially the defensive guys, they were all rooting for Ben. Like they knew because he was doing well against them in practice. So um, it was really cool to see. And there was just signs all week that we were going to win the game. Like, I don't know. He just had, a, he kept saying it. Like, he's like, you know, it sort of started in UNC and then, you know, he's trying to finish it there. So it was just kind of, it's kind of funny to see. And we just had the mentality that it was very similar to when we played Clemson in 2021. Like, mm. I don't know, we just had the mentality that we were going to win and we kept talking about it. We kept, you know, speaking it into existence. Um, going back to Emeka Mezzi, like we just always, like we, we, we try to speak things into existence and that week for sure felt similar in, mm -hmm. in the way we just spoke it into existence. We were going to win the game. So wow. when, probably before the season, no one would look at NC State and say that's the deepest QB room in the country. But I think now after seeing what you guys have done, uh, you could definitely make that argument. We talked about Ben, talk to me about MJ Morris, because I think uh, a lot of NC State fans are looking forward to seeing him, whether it's the bowl game or not, but the future for NC State. And I mean, his talent is just obvious. So what did similar question to Ben, what did you see as a, as a wide receiver, as a go-to guy for all these guys? Um, what did you see from MJ Morris throughout the year that you thought perhaps he could put it together and, and do some of the special things that he did? Yeah, I saw his cool, calm demeanor, similar to Ben, but like they're very different in their own ways. And just the, the way he's able to move in the pocket, extend plays with his legs. And then lastly, just his ability to have touch on the football. Like mm. MJ has some really good touch. Like it usually is a young guy. I've seen it before. Where young guys come in and they try to throw the you know, the crap out of it. They try to like throw it hundred miles an hour. 
because they don't really uh, – I feel like the game's kind of fast for him, but I feel like the game really was slow for him, and he was able to put, you know, things in different places and touch on the football. And, like, you saw MJ, he was – like, as a freshman, it's hard to – go through your progression and hit the last progression mm -hmm. dig on the backside. Like he did that multiple times um, where I was just was like, dang, like that, that kid's good. And so <laughs> I saw that a lot and I'm excited for his future. But th those were similar words that I said too. dang, this, this kid is good. I mean, just from jump street, seeing, you know, how he was able to go through his reads and to see the playbook kind of, you know, that Virginia tech game. I mean, that's all the adversity in the world you have stacked up against you there he comes in and it's like, he's a kid out there just playing like literally. And, and then the next week to see that playbook open up even more and, and his understanding of the offense, future, super bright, future excited. I, I want to ask this there as a veteran guy, as a really good receiver, obviously, th did you go to any of these quarterbacks, you know, when Devin goes down and say, Hey, look guys, you know, I I've been here, done that. I'm going to help you out, whatever you need, whether it's if you can help, just throw it up to me or just helping them after practice or in the film room. What did those conversations look like? Because you might have had to have them, you know, three different times. That was probably the most tiring part just because I <laughs> – Same conversation. I knew, <laughs> yes. So, like, each week I would go meet extra, you know, even go try to eat some food with these guys, you know, maybe stay after practice late to – you know, work on certain things. Mm -hmm. And it got to a point where it was the next guy, then it was the next guy, then it was the next guy. I'm like, in my mind, I'm like, is this like, is this even going to like help me out? Is this going to be worth it? Like, just because it took a long time sure. to build that with, to build that with Devin. And so like, I knew I had to do a lot of work in a short amount of time to try to build any type of chemistry with these guys. Cause I really didn't have any reps with them all, all year, all season. Um, and so I did the best I could. I, I met extra, like I would come back and to the quarterback meetings. Like I'm the only, like, just go back to the meetings at night with coach back, Chris Proctor, um, and just see the game plan, go over, like talk through things with the quarterbacks, especially wow. on third, third down situations. Mm. Um, cause that's very, you know, important for our success as offense is just converting on third downs. And I feel like a lot of the time I'm utilizing those situations at a high level. So just, being on the same page in those situations um, and doing it every week. And it was, I mean, it was a long season just because I felt like a lot of effort was put into that by me, especially, um, but it was worth it at the end. We, we, um, I feel like, you know, did what we needed to do. Well, I think it paid off for sure there. Now uh, let's talk Duke's Mayo Bowl. As you can see, Max shirt, um, we're, we're sponsored by Duke's Mayo, but we also are very excited about this bowl game, NC State and Maryland. You're playing close to home. You're playing in Bank of America. How many people are you going to have at this game? I mean, you can be <laughs> honest with us there. How, how many people are you putting on your list here? I mean, so we have six tickets a person. There's me and Drake get six, so that's 12. And my uh -huh. mom already texted – my mom texted me yesterday, so we're going to need extra, so <laughs> – so you've been um, scheming, trading with how, the teammates? Yeah, how, how many extra? Because I, I love receiving those texts, especially like on a Thursday. <laughs> yeah, um, it really depends on uh, – I mean, my mom said her whole family's coming, so my dad's side is probably going to be coming too. So um, it should be pretty easy, though. I think um, it's usually easy for the bowl game to get extra tickets because, you know, it's not as hard as like a sellout, like a rivalry sure. game. Like, sure. So there's probably more options to get more tickets, so. No, but it's cool. Like my first ever college game was in Bank of America. Oh wow! Um, so we played South Carolina. Mm -hmm. I was a freshman. I redshirted. I didn't play, but I was there. We played Debo Samuel's. I saw him score three touchdowns <laughs> with my own eyes, uh, and he was literally beat us single handedly. Um, and then just sort of coming back to fruition, just of like the last game being there. It's kind of cool. Um, that is but, cool. That's awesome. That's <laughs> awesome. Man. Well, I got to ask you, are, are you a Mayo fan? Like, do you put it on your sandwiches and your recipe? You can be time? Honest. Okay, that, that's well, good. I, yeah, I'm, a, I'm a pretty big Mayo guy. That a sure. boy. So, so this is the perfect kind of, this is the perfect deal here. What about cook? Do you, do you grill? Do you cook? Are you chefing it up? You know, that's more of a summer thing. Um, okay. <laughs> in, the, in the summer, I tend to cook more because I have more time. In the season, you're In the season, you're so busy and it's like, I don't know. It takes a lot of energy to go to the store, <laughs> get all the food. Um, but I tend to put like mayo on grilled chicken and stuff yeah. like that. But I actually, I like mayo. There you go. Sure. Well, good news is they also have these Southern sauces. You got to check them out. I have them all up here. Listen, you <laughs> marinate your chicken, your hamburger meat, whatever you got to do. 
and you, you make it happen. Um, let's touch on the game for a second here because it, it, it's a very intriguing matchup. The last 66 times you guys have played this team, um, you're 33 and 33. So a deadlock even thing here, an old ACC rival. What kind of challenges do you think Maryland is going to present you guys in this game? I already watched them on uh, film. They play a lot of man-to-man. -man. They're up in your face. I think it's very similar to Louisville, the type of uh, defense they play, and just the way they uh, – they're, they're very fast, and they have a lot of speed. So I think it's going to be a great challenge for us. And then another challenge is just – or another thing that I've noticed is just I've never played a Big Ten team, so I'm excited. Wow. I've played every other – played every other Power Five conference team. So I'm excited to just, you know, play a team from the Big Ten. <laughs> There, you gotta go, man. Are you where are you headed right now? I'm, I'm good. I'm good. I'm good. I'm on the go. Um, I'm about to jump in this Uber, um, but I, I'm, I'm good to continue to talk. So, <laughs> you know what? We're good. I think we appreciate your time. You got to go in an Uber. You got places to be. Um, thanks for coming on with us, and good luck in the bowl game. Thanks again to Thayer Thomas for joining us. He had somewhere to go at the end of that he, Hey, he's mobile, on the move, ready, Uber's waiting outside. He had to go. But see, I love the dedication. He wasn't going to He wasn't gonna be like, hey, guys, got to catch an Uber. He was just going to keep talking in the Uber. So we really appreciate that. I mean, that's he, just nice. He literally said, hey, I mean, we can keep talking, whatever yeah. you guys want to do. That he's going to so literally dumb. be at his workout and still talking to us. And so, so we thought we should let him go. Dedicated. The, Dedicated. Thing Big shout out to Annabelle. Big shout out Coach Doran. And of course, our guy there, Thomas, joining us. And Danny Morrison. Man, what a great episode. That, that was fun, KG, to have all those perspectives about this bowl game. It was. And now it's time to make some picks on this game. The Dukes Mayo Bowl, number 23, NC State, 8 and 4 versus Maryland, the Maryland Terrapins, excuse me, 7 and 5. Oh, this terrible. is a noon game on ESPN on December 30th. And the line has moved. Now, we are recording this a little earlier. So. We'll see if the line has changed even more, but it's back to – it's at even. And Maryland was an initial favorite by a little bit. It's back to even. The total is at 47.5. And, and, Mac, I have some real nerdy stats on this Come game. on. Give them to me. You want, you want to hear them first? Yes. All right. <clears throat> okay, first of all – This might change my analysis. <laughs> okay, so this is the lowest total in a Maryland game this season. Wow. Maryland has scored a lot of points. Besides uh, two games early on, they've scored, I believe, 27 or more points in every game besides mm -hmm. two games early. Mm -hmm. So they will score. Now, I think we have two really good pass defenses. It's, wait, hold on. Say that again. I'm about to they, blow your stats out of the water. Go ahead. They will score? Uh, zero points against Penn State. That yeah, was that's three one Three games ago. Okay. Um, and then 10 points against Wisconsin. I believe those are the two where they haven't scored okay, there you go. 27 or more. There you go. I believe. That's enough. I if thought you not, said earlier. I'm so sorry. Keep going. Oh, I will fairly. sit here and, and be quiet. I'm sorry. Well, that goes into this other stat, that Maryland lost to all five Big Ten teams they played with winning records. <laughs> Love that. So that is interesting here because I've seen just kind of some some basic analysis where someone says, okay, well, Maryland has played in a tougher league. And, I mean, you, I guess Maryland does play so tough. in the East Division, so they do have to play Penn State and Michigan and Ohio State. True. But – none of their wins, you know, came against a team that would really impress you. So that's something mm -hmm. to keep in mind. Mm -hmm. And then the other thing that I thought was very interesting when you look at this NC State defense, Maryland has allowed a Big Ten high 39 sacks this season. So with how this defense is playing, specifically those backers for NC State, and I'll throw Tanner Engel in there because he, <laughs> he'll, he's um, been known to sack a guy every once in a while. I and and especially how they performed against UNC Mac. Like mm -hmm. I think this defense, and we'll see who comes back and whatever. But I think this defense is going to be locked in. Yeah, in no, this game. I, I don't think there's any question about it. I mean, you and you heard from Coach Doran about how meaningful those guys are to, to not just him but his program, and they're going to be missed. And man, some some of those guys have been here five six years, and to see that growth and that development has been really cool for, for them to. It doesn't stink to have a bowl game because I think they're going to go out and, and do really great things. But to have that UNC win mm -hmm. as your, you know, your your last win or your last yeah. game, you know, is, is certainly very cool. But you also do get a familiar face here in Maryland, and and especially for your fans, 
um, you know, to, to get that done. And so kind of a sweet way to go out. And, and I'm right there with you. I think that that defense is going to be really inspired. I think they're going to be jacked up, excited to go out there one more time in the city of Charlotte. Great stadium, great bowl game, a uh, great city to, to kind of just be a part of that whole experience. And you really just want to put on a show. And, and I think, you know, you can certainly build that underdog mentality and, and create that chip if you want to. And you really just go out there and make some noise. So the interesting thing, you know, to me, just to see the, the defensive approach, especially knowing that, you know, Maryland is so susceptible to sacks and, and giving up quarterback yeah. pressure and, you know, maybe uh, Talia trying to hold on to the ball too long when he's rolling out of the pocket. Uh, you know, what do those linebackers do? Do they kind of put on that those werewolf goggles and, and go to work? And, you know, Drake Thomas, I mean, my gosh, to see the, the tear that he went on to end the season, I think this is a really cool opportunity for him, if he decides to leave, to have this kind of last – exclamation point, if you will, on his resume before he goes to the NFL. No, I agree. And I think a lot of this, when it comes to Vegas and handicapping this game, a lot of it comes to the comes down to the Big Ten's reputation. Because to me, I don't know why Maryland would be favored. I, I guess you look at NC State and you think quarterback situation, but right. they also just beat UNC with their backup, 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 and MJ Morris might play. And so I think when you look at Maryland – the two games where they didn't score 27 or more, Mac, you mentioned that. It's Ohio State and Wisconsin. Or, sorry, not Ohio State. Penn State and Wisconsin. Mm-hmm. They, Penn State beat them 30 to nothing. Mm-hmm. And neither of us think Penn State's that good. Mm-hmm. They also, Maryland scored 30 on Ohio State. So I think you say, oh, well, Maryland scored 30 on Ohio State. But Mac and I would say, Maryland scored 30 on Ohio State. Like, that, <laughs> that's the difference is the perception of the Big Ten right. versus NC State who, yeah, NC State has a really bad loss. The BC loss is terrible. I think everyone would agree. It yes. would agree with that. After that loss, that's when I said, NC State, you just lost yourself a 10-win season. Like that, <laughs> you can't lose to BC. <laughs> but I think NC State has been really challenged in the ACC. And yeah. this defense and these older guys have been through so much with the quarterback situation mm-hmm. that I feel like you can put MJ or Ben back there, especially after what we saw in the UNC game. And that offense is going to be fine. Yeah, well, I, I think just kind of, you know, what the defense has gone through with that, you know, quarterback changes and, and trying to elevate the rest of the team. I mean, it was really interesting what Thayer Thomas said. I mean, the, the fact that he's like, is this worth it to keep doing this? Like, yeah. I'm spending all this extra time. Is is this really going to help me? And I think we saw that it did. Um, but that's kind of the, the team has really wrapped their arms around each other. And, man, we mentioned it with Coach, too, about this next man mentality. Whatever it takes to win a football game, I think NC State has done that really the last two, three years. I mean, they, they have found ways mm-hmm. to win. They are gritty. They embody the, the culture of the fans, the coach, the universe, like all this stuff. I mean, there are very few teams that I think kind of hold the standard to who they are and how they play. NC State's one of them. And, man, I just see this as a really cool opportunity to go and get nine wins two years in a row, yeah. uh, maybe ten last year if you want to put an asterisk on that, mm. um, just to see – you know, the, the building blocks of this program and, and the future success that they might have. I think it's obvious where I'm going with this pick because of my, um, the hill I'm going to die on is that the Big Ten is not that good. <laughs> so I'm just going to die on this hill. Like, you can join me there. I will die on it. I think we overrate the Big Ten pretty much every year. I think Ohio State's going to get boat race in the playoff. You can mark all this down. Their defense is going to get destroyed. So <laughs> that being said... <laughs> I'm taking NC State. It's even. I mean, go either way. I'm taking NC State to win. Yeah. And I just think that total is is a little too low at 47 yeah. and a half. I would yeah. go over there. Especially if MJ Morris plays. I, I think yeah. I'm going to I think I'm gonna read the room here. I think MJ plays. I think MJ plays. Because he think, was very he was very willing to answer and say, Yeah, he's good. He's healthy. Yeah. Because he could have been more vague. Right. And Devin leaving like I'm reading a lot of these different things. I think MJ's the future. I think the future's now. I think they're feeling good. And, Correct. man, just, you know, kind of this hurrah moment that, that I was mentioning that they're going to have, I really do like this. And I, I think defense is, is going to rise up. Uh, so I, I think that, man, I might go under. I might okay, go under. so the to- I know the total is scary because both of these <sighs> past defenses are pretty good. Yeah, and so that does worry me. But I just—that's the lowest. But here we go. I will. I I might say that if there's a good offense in the Big Ten or one of them, maybe it's Maryland. Maryland. 
I agree. And so does that maybe legitimize some of those defenses where I look at the stats every week and they're like, oh, the number one defense in the world is in the Big Ten. Well, it's because your other offenses are so bad. I'm look, I keep looking over here. People are probably distracted by me keep changing screens here. Um, all right, I'm going to join you on the over. I'm going to yeah. go over. I think both the quarterbacks under, have a day. Mac, life's too short to take the under. Come on. That's right. Who wants to do that? But I am taking the Wolfpack. I think that I think the defense does enough. I think MJ Morris is the guy. I think that we get really excited about NC State's future right here mm. with seeing his performance. Um, and then just to, to think of what it's going to look like you know, with Coach Robert and I and how excited Coach Dorn was about that and, you know, just the, the yeah. complexity of the offense, the multiple looks that I know they're going to show, and especially if they get some guys, you know, from the portal, Dakari Collins from Clemson's transferring there. Um, if they can get a couple of pieces in the offensive line and running the football, look out. I mean, there's there's going to be a lot to be excited about for NC State. So I'm with you, KG. Let's die on this hill together and uh, let's fight <laughs> off the, the, the Big Ten, the three to six games. We can do That's that. We right. can get rid of those. <laughs> That's right. Get out of here, Big Ten. Jeez. <laughs> Unbelievable. Well, guys, best episode of the year. It's over. Sadly enough, three guests jam-packed. The biggest bowl game, the Duke Mayo Bowl. I'm, I'm super excited about this. Can't wait to see it. Are you going to the game, KG? We've talked about this a little bit back before. <sighs> I've got a lot going on with basketball and other responsibilities. So we'll see. I'm going to go a TBD on that. Okay. But I will tell you right now, Mac, I'm going to go cut up a tomato and put some brown sugar bourbon <laughs> mustard right on now, it. All right now. I love that's it. That's what I'm doing. I love it. Well, that's it, guys. That's it from the Duke's Mayo Bowl episode. Everything you want to know. You can't find this anywhere else right here. Uh, thank you to our producer, Richmond Weaver, does a great job. There's a couple bumps in the road with all these interviews and things that we have to do. So he makes us sound and look perfect. Uh, really appreciate him. Rich Takes on Sports is his podcast. Go check that out. Any story you can ever imagine. He's got it going on there. you got to check it out there. Uh, but that's it from us. Thank you for tuning in. We need you to go over to YouTube, smash that subscribe button, uh, rate, review, and, and uh, subscribe. Comment is another thing we'd love to hear from you guys. Uh, but until next time, we'll see you all.